so our next speaker is going to be Laura Tilt. Uh, Laura is a freelance registered dietitian and a successful health writer. Uh, Laura specializes in gut health and nutrition and is trained to deliver the low FODMAP diet for IBS. Um, so I will hand over to Laura. Well, good morning and thank you for joining me for this talk. And thank you to Barmuno for inviting me to share my experiences and chat about irritable bowel syndrome from the dietitian's perspective. My name is Laura Tilt, I'm a registered dietitian and I'm going to be talking for about half an hour and there'll be time for questions afterwards. So as I said, I'm a registered dietitian and a health writer. I just wanted to give you a bit of background as to how I became interested in IBS. Um, it started around 10 years ago when I was working as a dietitian in UCLH Hospital uh, in the gastroenterology department. And then I was asked to run a clinic on a Tuesday afternoon for patients with IBS as an outpatient clinic. And when I was doing this clinic, I realised quite quickly that I knew not very much about managing IBS from the dietetic perspective, um, but also that there seemed to be a lot of misinformation. So I was having a lot of patients coming in telling me that they'd been told to cut out gluten or dairy or take lots of expensive supplements. Um, and I really wanted to advocate for these people. And so it became a bit of a mission of mine to learn as much as I could about the condition um, and improve the patient care that I offered. It was about a year and a half later that the FODMAP diet, uh, which is um, a, a dietetic therapy for the management of IBS, came to the UK. I did my training with King's College and later with Monash University, who developed the diet as well. And this actually allowed me to improve my care um, or improve what I offered for patients considerably, um, which was great. And since then, I've actually stopped working in the NHS, so I'm a fully freelance dietitian now, uh, but I still run a weekly clinic for people with IBS. Um, and I have also recently, in the last year or so, started working in eating disorders. And I wanted to mention that because there's some crossover that I'm going to talk about uh, in a little while. Um, some other things that may be of interest. So uh, when I was working at UCLH, I started a podcast called the Gut Loving Podcast. And this was all about IBS and the low FODMAP diet. Um, and really was just for, for patients and other healthcare professionals to learn more about IBS and how we manage it from a dietetic perspective. But as the podcast went on, we also started to interview people about other therapies, um, medications, that type of thing as well. So it's been a really useful resource, I think, for um, that I can refer people to. And I also created something called the IBS Guide, and this is a 12-week um, online program, self um, self-help program, I guess, for people. What I was trying to do with that is to fill the gap. So if someone wasn't able to access a dietitian, then they would um, have a resource that they could turn to, a fairly inexpensive one. So um, that's my background, and that's why I became interested in IBS in my experience. So let's get on with the talk. Okay. But before I start talking about IBS and the dietetic approach, I wanted to step back in time and just take a little bit of a look at how we used to think about managing IBS and how it's changed. Um, so IBS or irritable colon, as it was first known, first appeared in medical literature around the 1920s. Um, and unfortunately, if you were, if you were diagnosed with um, irritable colon at this time, you probably would have been subjected to quite a lot of unnecessary investigations and potentially even surgery. Um, and sadly, um, this kind of continued in the sort of uh, confusion around how best to manage it. Even as late as the 1970s, I found an entry in the British Medical Journal, which said that the main aim of treatment was to teach the patient just to live with their symptoms. It didn't seem like there was anything else that, um, that could be done. Um, which is quite bleak, really, uh, for anybody who was affected. But I'm really happy to say that fast forward to 2022 and things have got a lot better. And I took this quote from a recent um, article, um, which I have referenced at the bottom about the future of IBS care. And it said that IBS care in 2022 um, and beyond no longer relies on just the GI doctor, but it is a team sport that involves multidisciplinary integrative care team of doctors, dietitians and behavioural therapists. Um, and this is much more positive, but I think and much more hopeful and really sort of shows us like how far things have come. Um, and also just the importance of these uh, different therapeutic approaches. It's not just um, that are sort of not just medical, if you like. OK, so I thought I would talk a little bit about what IBS is and how it's diagnosed, just because I don't think anyone else is covering that today. So um, I thought it might be helpful. 
So irritable bowel syndrome um, is what is known or has been known for quite a few years as a functional uh, gut disorder. So in IBS, there is no structural changes in the gut. Uh, there's no disease in the gut, but it is a condition which affect how, affects how the gut functions. It's really, really common um, and it is chronic. So it is something which um, generally lasts a long time, um, but Fun symptoms can be relapsing and remitting. So somebody might have really well controlled symptoms for quite a few years, but then go through a period of what we might call a flare up. Um, more recently, IBS has been termed a disorder of gut brain interaction. It was actually named so in the, it's actually 2021, um, our American College of Gastroenterology guidelines. And this just really acknowledges or sort of indicates how our understanding of IBS has changed. And now it's recognised that um, the gut brain axis plays a big role and some dysregulation of that um, is probably relevant in IBS. I think it's always worth having some patient friendly explanations in your toolkit. Uh, quite often I have seen patients in clinic who've been told you've got IBS, off you go, and haven't really had much explanation as to what the condition is or what it means. So I've just put a couple of explanations that I think are really helpful for patients. So IBS affects how your gut moves and functions, uh, causing um, symptoms like abdominal pain and a change in your poo or IBS is a condition which means your gut is extra sensitive to normal stimuli like um, food moving through your gut, changes in hormones, medication and stress. And I like the phrase extra sensitive because that's really what irritable means and it kind of helps people to understand that they've got an extra sensitive tummy to things which may not bother other people. So how is IBS diagnosed? Well, currently there's no um, biochemical markers that can be used, so nothing we can check in someone's blood or urine to say you've got IBS. Uh, so it's a symptom-based diagnosis in the absence of red flags, such as unintentional weight loss, nocturnal symptoms, blood in stools, family history of bowel cancer. Any of these red flags would, um, would indicate that more investigations are necessary. But in the absence of red flags, then a symptom-based uh, diagnosis is, is used. And there's two criteria. So we've got the Rome criteria from the Rome Foundation from 2016 and also the NICE guidelines here in the UK, which were published in 2008, but updated in 2017. And they are really similar. I'm not going to go through them in detail here, but both... Um, require the presence of abdominal pain. The Rome criteria is a bit specific about how often, so one day a week, um, that pain that is related to defecation and associated with a change in bowel um, habits, so stool free, form and frequency. Uh, so other symptoms are often present, such as bloating, um, but this isn't necessary for a diagnosis. So something else which is really useful within diagnosis is to determine the subtype of IBS. So the predominant stool pattern, so IBSD for diarrhea or IBSC for constipation or IBSM for a mixed pattern. And the Bristol stool chart is really helpful for um, identifying the subtype. Uh, identifying the subtype is important, I think, from a dietetic therapy perspective, uh, because it actually really helps us to tailor the advice. So some uh, pieces of advice or some particular dietary changes are more helpful for those with IBS, constipation predominant IBS. Others are better for someone with diarrhea predominant IBS. So really helpful to try and determine that stool type if possible. So who does IBS affect? So globally, it's around 10 to 20% of the population, depending on which criteria is used. Um, so a really, really common condition. It's twice as common in women as men. Um, this could be because more women are presenting um, to medical professionals about symptoms. But equally, there may be a role for um, sex hormones as well. And rates are highest amongst adults who are under 50 years of age. There is a crossover between eating disorders and irritable bowel syndrome. And I wanted to give this a mention because I think it's, um, I don't think it's that well known. And it's something that certainly I've become more aware of. So around 40% of, 40 to 50% of people with an eating disorder would actually qualify for a diagnosis of IBS. Uh, so gastrointestinal symptoms are extremely common in eating disorders, both anorexia um, and bulimia. 
uh, for example, bloating is super common and constipation as well. Uh, but these symptoms are secondary to the effects of the eating disorder on the gut. Now, if they are wrongly diagnosed um, or if they are diagnosed just as IBS and there's no recognition that these symptoms are as a result of an eating disorder or restrictive eating pattern, then someone won't be able to access the right care. And we may actually be doing more um, damage by actually um, adding additional restrictions or changes to their diet. So it's really important they're aware of this and do screen for eating disorders as part of our assessment to ensure that the correct care is provided. So what causes IBS? What is behind the condition? So it's what we call, it has what we call biopsychosocial etiology. So there's um, uh, biological, uh, psychological and social factors which play a role. And it's likely that there's no one factor that, that has caused IBS, but a number of factors which may mean someone is more susceptible to developing the condition. Uh, I've put some of the factors here. So um, altered visceral perceptions, around 60% of people with IBS have extra sensitive nerve endings in the gut, which means that they are more sensitive to this normal passage of food and uh, fluid um, through the gut, for example. Changes in the microbiome. So we know that patients with IBS tend to have lower levels of some beneficial microbes in the gut. So this potentially could play a role. Chronic stress. So we know that for some people, IBS develops um, alongside or around the time of a chronic stress. So perhaps, for example, a bereavement or something like a divorce. Equally, early life, life trauma may play a role. Um, and it's actually really common for uh, patients with anxiety and depression to also um, or to have a higher risk of developing or have having IBS too. There's a subset of IBS known as post-infective IBS, so this develops after food poisoning, and um, this is becoming more well characterised now. Um, also changes in uh, gut motility um, and candidate genes, so you're more likely to have IBS if it runs in the family, so there is a hereditary factor as well. So once someone has been diagnosed with IBS, we can start to think about the options for managing the condition and helping to improve symptoms and therefore quality of life. So as, the, as outlined in the NICE guidelines, there's broadly three different options. So pharmacotherapy or medications, these might include things like laxatives or medications which target um, pain. Uh, diet and lifestyle advice. So lifestyle advice is around exercise or movement and also stress management. And then dietary advice falls into what we call first line and second line. And I'm going to talk more about those. And then thirdly, gut directed psychological support uh, should be considered in patients who don't respond to pharmacological treatments after 12 months. But there are also more and more self-help options um, becoming available in this particular area of therapy. And I'm going to mention those too. So as you can see from the NICE guidelines, diet is a cornerstone therapy for IBS symptom management. So why is this? Well, a huge nine in 10 people with IBS actually report that food makes their symptoms worse. Um, and therefore about two thirds of um, people with IBS, about 70% will actually go on to initiate dietary restrictions in order to try and control or improve their symptoms. And therefore, if people are trying to make these changes to the diet themselves, it's actually really important that we help to guide them and to make sure that their diet doesn't become over-restricted and also that they put their energies into making the best adjustments or the adjustments that are going to help them the most. And the reason that people find that food triggered symptoms is because it does have a mechanism to do so. So we know that certain foods and drinks can affect gut motility. So for example, caffeine is a really common one, uh, can increase motility in the large intestine, so may aggravate things like loose stools. Certain foods are result in more gas production um, because they're more fermentable and poorly absorbed and therefore they can increase gas production and that gas production can stress, stretch the walls of the intestine and trigger those extra sensitive nerve endings in the IBS sensitive tummies. So there's mechanisms by which food can cause symptoms. We have seen that in research and therefore these are the areas that we can focus on. Now, historically, dietary advice for IBS wasn't great. In fact, at one point, it seemed to be focused mostly around fibre and increasing fibre, which we now know can actually aggravate symptoms. But happily, there was a paper published in 2016 um, around evidence-based practice guidelines for the dietary management of IBS. 
and this paper was published as a result of work from the British Dietetic Association, a specialist group of uh, dietitians from the BDA who got together to review all the evidence around IBS and diet and come up um, with these 15 evidence-based recommendations and an algorithm for managing patients within clinical practice. So you can see the algorithm here. So once someone is diagnosed with IBS, uh, they are then provided with first, what we call first line, advice and I'm going to go over that in a bit more detail. If that's successful in improving their symptoms um, to a manageable level then they can be discharged for long-term self-management. If it isn't successful that they will then be or they can then access what we call second line uh, therapy which is a low FODMAP diet and if this is successful again the patient will then move on to the second and third stage of the diet before um, long-term self-management and but if it isn't successful they are then um, sent back to the referrer and potentially or potentially on to another practitioner who may may be of help for them. The recommendations that form the first line approach are listed here and they cover both eating habits and also certain foods or characteristics of foods like um, they contain fat or spice and also drinks which have the mechanisms to trigger symptoms or aggravate symptoms. It's really worth actually having a look at the paper and the evidence behind these recommendations because not all of the um, recommendations are based on um, really what we would call high quality evidence. In fact, a lot is quite weak evidence, but it is the best that we have. But that means that some of it might be observational, um, based on really small numbers of people or actually um, being pulled across, the learnings pulled across from um, data that we have in people without IBS, but we're applying it to this population. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that not all the recommendations will be beneficial to all subtypes. So, for example, uh, caffeine can increase motility in the large intestine uh, and that may aggravate symptoms of diarrhoea in someone with diarrhoea predominant in IBS. So that may be a really relevant recommendation to someone with that subtype. Um, but actually, for somebody with um, constipation predominant IBS, then actually a cup of coffee may actually help them to open their bowels. So we certainly need to be thinking about the IBS subtype and choosing the recommendations accordingly. Accordingly. I've also put down here around the NICE guidelines, so they have some additional recommendations on res reducing resistant starch, uh, with, which is a type of carbohydrate that is found in some foods, but also uh, when some foods are prepared in a certain way. So when, for example, potatoes are cooked and then cooled and then eaten, for example, as a potato salad, um, they contain higher proportion of resistant starch. Now, resistant starch isn't very well absorbed in the large uh, in the small intestine, and therefore lands in the large intestine and has the capacity to increase gas production, uh, and they can therefore trigger symptoms. There's also advice around limiting fruit to three portions a day, and that's to limit fructose, which again, if uh, consumed in excess amounts, can um, trigger bloating and gas. So these are the first line recommendations. I'm not gonna go into them in any more detail because I'm sort of limited on time today, um, but they're worth, they're worth becoming familiar with and particularly um, the advice around fibre, uh, because again, we need to think about um, whether fibre can be um, maybe helpful for a subtype or may actually, uh, a reduction may actually. Now these first line recommendations have been summarised really nicely in this food fact sheet from the British Dietetic Association which is available freely to download uh, and is a really helpful kind of resource that you can use with patients. So this approach has uh, pros and cons like any approach. So positively, most of the changes, as you can see, are relatively simple. Um, and certainly this approach is much less restrictive and much less challenging than the low FODMAP diet. And it can be delivered by any healthcare professional with an interest in IBS. Um, and it's also pretty patient friendly in terms of cost and convenience. However, on the other side, I think it's quite easy to overlook these recommendations. Lots of patients think that they probably won't make a difference um, and therefore it may be less interesting or they may have less motivation to try them. However, I would say having worked with people with IBS for quite a few years now, actually if you uh, combining several of these recommendations together that are um, right for their subtype can really make a difference. So it's definitely worth encouraging them to try it. However, this approach might not be sufficient for somebody with severe symptoms and people need may need to layer other therapies on top. And I do think some of the changes, such as discussions around adjusting fibre intake, are probably best supported by a dietitian. In terms of its effectiveness, one study found that this approach was as effective as a low FODMAP diet. 
Um, but other studies have found that the low FODMAP diet um, actually is, is more effective than this first line approach. If the first line approach doesn't work or the patient doesn't get a significant or satisfactory symptom improvement from following that advice, they can follow the second line approach, which is the low FODMAP diet. So I'm pretty sure that everybody will have heard of the low FODMAP diet by now, but in case not, a recap, the low FODMAP diet is a type of elimination diet that was developed by Monash University in Australia, and it restricts a group of carbohydrates known as FODMAPs, which are a group of short chain sugars that are not very easily digested or absorbed in the gut, uh, in the small intestine. And so what happens is that they travel through the gut relatively unchanged and they land in the large intestine where they are readily fermented by the gut bacteria uh, and the gut bacteria consume the FODMAPs, produce gas which stretches the walls of the intestine and can cause pain. Uh, the gas um, can be experienced um, as bloating and also the presence of undigested FODMAPs uh, can also draw water into the bowel um, which can aggravate loose stools. So there's a very clear mechanism for which FODMAPs can induce symptoms in people with IBS. Um, and this diet was developed around 2016 and many, many studies have uh, demonstrated that it is effective in reducing symptoms. Now, FODMAPs are found in a wide range of carbohydrate containing foods. There's no way to know which foods contain FODMAPs. Um, so uh, as an example, FODMAPs are found in onions and garlic and leeks and sweet potatoes. So you can see some of the foods in this picture uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and some foods contain one FODMAP, some foods contain a combination of FODMAPs. But as I say, there's no way to know just by eyeballing them. Um, uh, all foods have undergone testing um, to be able to identify their FODMAP content. And someone who's trained in the diet um, will be able to help someone navigate their way through this approach. The approach itself, the low FODMAP diet, is a three-stage approach. So in the first uh, initial stage, once somebody has been assessed as being suitable for the diet, they will follow what we call the elimination phase. Now this lasts for two to six weeks and during this phase, someone will restrict the FODMAP, uh, all the high FODMAP foods in their diet and will replace them with low FODMAP alternatives. If as a result of doing this, they experience an improvement in their symptoms, they will then move on to what we call reintroduction phase. Now in the reintroduction phase, someone will reintroduce the FODMAP groups one at a time to see which they're sensitive to and um, to learn what their tolerance is. And in the final stage, personalization, they will, using those results from the reintroduction, go on to reintroduce everything back into their diet that they can tolerate well and just um, continue to minimize or restrict the foods which actually they have found to trigger their symptoms. If someone doesn't have a significant improvement as a result of following the elimination phase, they can just essentially abandon the diet and go back to their diet previously. Um, because uh, what we do know is that although the FODMAP diet is very effective, um, it, it doesn't work for everybody. A really important thing to remember is that the FODMAP diet should be uh, carried out in conjunction with the support of a FODMAP trained dietitian. Um, I have certainly worked with people before who have been told to do the diet by themselves or look it up online and in my experience um, uh, this doesn't lead to good results. Um, it takes a long time to learn how to teach the diet um, and that's why a dietitian is important. So quite often people will get confused, will end up over restricting or may end up getting stuck on a particular part of the diet. So it's not unusual for me to hear that people have got stuck on the elimination phase for maybe a couple of years and actually have then become really anxious about reintroducing foods. So really important to work with a FODMAP trained dietitian. This can be requested through the GP, or there's actually a directory online of um, FODMAP trained dietitians, which somebody may want to access privately uh, if they can't access it through, um, through the NHS. A FODMAP trained dietitian, as well as um, knowing the diet and being able to support the patient, will be able to assess whether they're actually suitable for the diet, so it isn't right for everybody, uh, and can also adjust the diet accordingly for the patient. So, for example, I have certainly used the diet, a simplified version of the diet, or actually used the diet in a reverse sense to help people expand um, what they're eating when they have become very restricted. The pr 
pros and cons of the FODMAP diet. Um, so the pros, it can be life-changing. So research suggests that around 70% of people with IBS will experience symptom improvement as a result of following a low FODMAP diet. So this is a really significant amount of people and that's why it's such an attractive approach. Um, there were uh, initially concerns that the diet wasn't nutritionally adequate, but if it is properly planned and low FODMAP, uh, high FODMAP foods are replaced with low FODMAP alternatives, which are nutritionally similar, um, then it can definitely um, be nutritionally adequate. And what we know is once someone's moved on to the personalization stage where they're no longer kind of in full elimination, um, then actually their diet it, it can provide everything that they need. The cons, so the diet is really tricky uh, to follow. It takes three months minimum um, from start to finish. Uh, and people can feel quite socially isolated while on the diet because it's difficult to eat out and maybe difficult to eat with friends. It's sort of, you're not just opening a fridge and, or going to a coffee shop and choosing anything anymore. So there's quite a lot of thought process involved. Um, and some studies have shown that there is a reduction in some types of beneficial bacteria. So a group of uh, microbes and it's bifidobacteria during the FODMAP restriction. That's because normally these uh, FODMAP um, carbohydrates or sugars would actually feed these beneficial microbes in the gut. Um, so initially that was um, quite a big concern as a result of following the diet but the latest data we have suggests that this um, FODMAP dysbiosis if you want to call it that is actually short term and once somebody has moved on to personalization then that is reversed. So again really really important that we are moving people through those three stages. So that's the, broadly speaking, the two approaches that we can use in um, uh, as the dietetic therapy. So first line recommendations and the second line approach of a low FODMAP diet. So what might you want to consider when deciding on an approach with a patient or a client? So I've just put here some of the things that I am thinking about when I see somebody in clinic. So how long they've had IBS and what approaches they've tried before. You definitely want to be listening to what they have tried um, and have or haven't found successful um, what their primary and most bothersome symptoms are so that's really going to help you match out the best recommendations for them uh, and you can certainly use a stool chart and a symptom assessment to help you with that I'd really be thinking about when their symptoms started and if it was with the onset of any kind of significant life events such as food poisoning or stress again that will help you to uh, determine the best therapies for them Really want to be looking for any evidence of disordered restricted eating or um, a history of an eating disorder and certainly or, or malnutrition or significant weight loss. And certainly if that is the case, then you will want to be avoiding any further restriction. Your dietary and lifestyle assessment. So you will be wanting to think about um, assessing their diet for common trigger foods uh, like caffeine, spicy foods. Uh, looking at any existing dietary restrictions, so they, do they follow a vegetarian or vegan diet, which would be further restricted if you added some uh, some of these recommendations or perhaps followed the low FODMAP diet. Thinking about what their capacity for change is, are they a really busy mum and actually asking them to follow a low FODMAP diet just isn't going to be realistic. Um, mm -hmm. So thinking about all those aspects and also um, the, st the stress, any stress in their lifestyle, what their sleeping um, habits are like, that type of thing. Once you have uh, assessed their diet and lifestyle and you're thinking about the approach, it's really important that you discuss it with the patient um, to see what their thoughts are, you know, whether they would feel motivated or want to follow that approach. And also just discussing the pros and cons. Um, people come to my clinic, clinic quite often really wanting to follow a low FODMAP diet, but I think it's really important to discuss with them first that it is a three month process. And quite often when we've discussed this, um, they've decided that actually they'd like to try maybe some of the first line recommendations or a simplified process um, first. Thinking about what other support or resources they might need to um, make their their journey easier um, and to improve the care that you provide. So obviously you're going to be seeing them once in clinic and then you may not see them again for another month. So what might they need in the interim to help them? And equally, what other practitioners or therapies might be helpful? So I'm thinking about stress management or um, uh, movement, for example, here. So diet doesn't necessarily work for everybody and won't necessarily um, be the answer to improving symptoms for every of, or all of your patients. And so we need to also think about what to do when diet doesn't work. So I certainly do discuss movement and stress management with all of my patients uh, in clinic now. We talk about the effects of exercise and stress on the gut, so it's definitely worth familiarising yourself with those um, because they can make a really big difference to people. 
Uh, we also discuss medications. So these can carry a lot of stigma. Quite often people are not keen to take medications, but they um, are in some cases um, really necessary and helpful. And I would certainly encourage patients uh, to discuss that with their GP if they haven't already. I mentioned that if after 12 months they haven't had any improvement um, after using pharmacotherapy um, or pharmacological um, approaches, and then they can be considered for psychological approaches. So in particular, cognitive behavioural therapy and gut-directed hypnotherapy have both been shown to be effective in terms of symptom improvement. However, I'm not sure how accessible these are within the NHS, um, I think more so in some areas than others. But happily, um, what we're starting to see is more um, digital tools that offer these particular therapies. So I have mentioned before that uh, there is a, an app called Nerva, which is gut-directed hypnotherapy, and an app called Zemedy, which is based uh, on a programme of cognitive behavioural therapy. These are six week programs which are pretty cost effective, they're easily accessed, most people have a mobile phone now um, and these are things that you can recommend to your patients, that you can refer them to and you can also track their progress through their sort of um, practitioner dashboards as well. You also might be wanting to think about referring on to other specialists. If diet hasn't worked, you may be referring back to the GP. You may be referring back to the gastroenterologist. Um, and it may be that you have an inkling that um, maybe your patient needs to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist if there may be um, evidence of pelvic floor dysfunction, or you may feel that perhaps they, um, they may benefit from some other testing, for example, for um, uh, sea base, so small intestine bacterial overgrowth or bile acid malabsorption. So finally, I'm um, approaching my 30 minutes, so I'm going to try and speed through these next three few slides. So where do pre and probiotics fit into the picture? So um, uh, prebiotics and probiotics, we can think of those as um, agents which may help to shape the microbiome. Uh, and so they may have a basis for use in IBS care. And that's if you think about the reasons for that, so as I mentioned, we research to show that there are changes in the microbiome in patients with IBS and that may play a role in the development of the condition. Uh, there's a potential that lower levels of short chain fatty acids could contribute to changes in bowel patterns and that lower levels of some types of beneficial bacteria may be associated with higher pain scores. We also know that restricted diet, so I've talked about the effect of the FODMAP diet on the microbiome, but let's bear in mind that somebody may be coming to clinic having fo followed specific dietary restrictions that they have instigated themselves for many years. They may have been following a low carbohydrate diet for many years that has had an impact on the gut microbiome. Microbiome. So we have a basis for thinking that we may benefit or the patient may benefit from using pre and probiotics. What do the guidelines say about the use of probiotics in irritable bowel syndrome? So first of all, a quick reminder that probiotics are live microbes that when consumed in adequate amounts have a positive effect on the person consuming them. So the guidelines that we have, or the research that we have, suggests that probiotics are safe to trial in patients with IBS. However, any symptom benefit is likely to be mild, so it's not um, what we see from the evidence is that there may be some improvement, but it may it's likely it's not likely to be significant. And unfortunately, we don't have enough evidence at the moment to make recommendations around um, the best strains or the best dose for people with IBS. If we look at the latest guidelines from the British Society of Gastroenterology, uh, they suggest or they have a recommendation that it's reasonable to trial a probiotic product for up to 12 weeks. The BDA guidelines from the specialist group that I mentioned earlier have recommended since 2016 uh, that we advise patients to trial one product at a time for at least four weeks and then to monitor symptoms. If there hasn't been any improvement after four weeks, then they may benefit from trying another product instead. Now, what I found generally is that patients will want a recommendation about which probiotic to try. Um, and certainly we obviously want them to put their money to a product that we think may be helpful. There are certainly a few strains and a few brands which have been shown or have some evidence behind them in terms of um, symptom improvement and IBS. 
uh, the US probiotic guide, which I have mentioned here, actually shows strains um, which have evidence for um, particular symptoms. So my advice would be to have a look at that and to match a strain to the desired benefit. So for example, if your patient is experiencing constipation or bloating, you'll want to try and choose a probiotic which has at least some evidence to, uh, to show that it has benefit that, benefited that particular symptom. What about prebiotics? First, just a reminder what prebiotics are. So prebiotics are essentially food for microbes. So they're substrates that selectively feed the beneficial microbes in the gut. I like to think of prebiotics as basically watering the roses in your gut garden. So there aren't any official guidelines covering the use of prebiotics in IBS at the moment. And this is because the majority of evidence that exists um, around the use of prebiotics is in people without IBS. This might change as research evolves, um, but that's the current picture. In 2019, there was a meta-analysis and this looked at all the trials um, that had used prebiotics in functional gut disorders. So there were 11 in total. Uh, and in this meta-analysis, the authors concluded that the use of prebiotics in functional gut disorders could actually increase bifidobacteria. So that's that beneficial uh, group of microbes, but didn't result in any symptom improvement. Whether or not we may have seen symptom improvement if these studies went on for longer isn't clear. However, if uh, you look into the paper in a bit more detail, you will see that the effects or the prebiotic effects were varied according to the type and dose of prebiotic used. So most prebiotics on the market are inulin based, uh, often synthesized from chicory root. And these are very readily fermented in the gut. And that means that they often increase uh, gas production now, for somebody with IBS, that may well not be a problem and they may not experience much discomfort. But for somebody with IBS, um, having an inulin type prebiotic is likely to uh, make them really, really uncomfortable. So the advice would be to stick to smaller doses of less than six grams. An alternative is to use a non-inulin type prebiotic. So... Um, uh, beta uh, prebiotic or biomuno uh, actually has um, so the opposite effect it actually is less likely to increase gas production um, whilst still increasing bifidobacteria um, and there's some evidence that it might have some positive effect on symptom scores so it's worth bearing in mind if you're advising a patient on choosing a prebiotic. To summarise things that I would be thinking about when advising a patient on pre and probiotics is thinking about their history and their predominant symptoms, whether they've used pre or probiotics before, and just really discussing those expectations with them so they're not likely to get a really significant improvement. But equally, it's something that is safe to trial um, and they can do without restricting their diet. Really important, I think, to have some guidance or resources ready on what type of pre or probiotic they might want to use um, and aiming to guide them towards a strain or a product which does have, does have some evidence in, um, uh, in either people with IBS or for a particular symptom that they are experiencing. Um, and also thinking about checking that that product um, doesn't contain any ingredients which may trigger their symptoms. So as I mentioned about inulin previously. Well, that brings me towards the end of my talk. Uh, we've discussed the different dietary approaches for IBS, what to do when diet doesn't work, and also where pre and probiotics fit into the picture. And I just wanted to round up by talking about some things to remember or my top tips. So there really is no one size fits all when it comes to the dietetic care of patients with IBS and every patient's care will look slightly different. I think it's really important to manage patient expectations. So a patient might need to try several therapies. Uh, they may, it may be a bit of a trial and error process until you find the thing that really helps them. And equally, um, a bit of a hard reality is that you may not have the answer and it might actually be another practitioner which is best suited to helping them. I know as dietitians, it's a, a helping um, profession and that's what we always want to do. But sometimes the best thing we could do is recognise that diet isn't the right approach and actually there may be um, a better practitioner or a better to see your practitioner. Empathy is really important. Quite often, um, IBS carries a lot of stigma. Somebody might feel that they've not been heard. So actually providing a space where someone can talk is really important and, and often really appreciated too. 
I think a thorough assessment is really important for helping you to identify the best approach. Um, and as I said, remembering that diet might not always be the best answer um, and actually just being really honest with the patient about that if, if that is what you feel. Uh, developing a toolkit I think is really important so you have resources at your fingertips that can be used to support a patient uh, whether that is around pre and probiotics whether that's around stress management um, whether that's actually just teaming up with um, other practitioners that you can refer on to and learn from I think it's really important um, and yeah my other advice is just to follow other practitioners that are working in the area whether that might be uh, gut directed hypnotherapists or um, CBT therapists other dietitians because you can certainly uh, learn from them and as you keep learning then it will improve your the, the, the quality um, of patient care. Finally I've included a list of resources here which may be helpful so there's the BDA food fact sheet that I mentioned I referenced some of the guidelines that I've used in this presentation and um, some information on pre and probiotics the apps that I mentioned that cover the gut directed psychotherapies um, and also the patient webinars so these are resources that um, chat through the first line advice and the low FODMAP diet so really helpful um, resources that you can direct patients to particularly if they don't have access to a dietitian and finally of course the Monas FODMAP website which has an excellent course both for dietitians and one for patients as well and they have the most update information on all things FODMAP like to thank you for your time and attention. I hope the information shared today has been useful and now I'd like to invite any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was extremely educational. <laughs> I, I never had any, I, I didn't realise that there are so many contributing factors to IBS. Yeah, yeah. So, and probably no, no single factor is behind IBS, but a combination, so yeah. So we've had a lot of questions from our live audience already. So I hope you're prepped to answer a few of them. <laughs> yes, okay. Okay, so from Harriet, uh, could eating disorders cause IBS symptoms in the long term? And once someone has recovered from an eating disorder, could they experience IBS symptoms for years later? So to my knowledge, we don't have a lot of long term research around um, gut symptoms in uh, individuals who have recovered from eating disorders. But anecdotally, I would say um, that, yes, they can cause symptoms in the long term. So just to give you an example, I would say the most severe symptoms. So in anorexia, for example, gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying is really, really common and also constipation. And as I was explaining, these um symptoms or these effects are secondary to the effects of the eating disorder in the gut so restricted um, food intake so those symptoms would tend to improve um, with weight rehabilitation and as somebody increases their calorie intake but certainly I have worked with individuals who have restored their weight to what we would regard as a healthy or normal BMI and are still struggling with symptoms like bloating or are still struggling with constipation um even kind of months after they have effectively recovered so i would say that yes it's possible in terms of why this is i suspect that there may be a role for the gut microbiome so we definitely know that there are profound changes in the microbiome in patients with anorexia again this is quite new research that they're doing so we've got a lot more to learn but there certainly is a reduction in the diversity of the gut microbiome and also we see a shift towards a more methane producing bacteria Bacteria and actually that's associated with constipation so I think there's quite a lot for us to learn but certainly I would say in my experience somebody can kind of continue to experience symptoms um, even after they've recovered probably those most severe symptoms will improve but it may not be that they get a complete resolution of um, these functional symptoms. Okay um, very closely linked to that uh, mm -hmm. Joe on YouTube has asked if you've ever found a uh, percentage of clients with IBS who go on to develop eating disorders as opposed to it being the other way around? Um, I haven't I haven't really looked into the research to compare, you know, with this kind of crossover. What I would say is that it's obviously, it's certainly possible. It would depend on somebody's, I guess, somebody's background. So we know that there are a number of factors that make somebody more vulnerable to developing an eating disorder, such as uh, uh, body image concerns, maybe early life trauma, um, uh, other factors, maybe 
be perfectionism, so certain kind of characteristics that would make somebody more vulnerable. So, um, and those characteristics, some of them cross over with eating, dis uh, with eating disorders, with IBS. So we sort of talked about um, the etiology of IBS um, and the different factors, and some of those would cross over. So for example, early life trauma, um, having a history of anxiety as well so yeah it's possible but I would say um, somebody would would probably exhibit those characteristics as well if that makes sense yeah yes, that's great uh, Neve asks um, if you're following the FODMAP diet if a reintroduced food causes is an initial flare-up it's a result of not having the food for a few weeks or you're not being used to it and if that's continued to be eaten for longer than three days, will the flare up sub subside, suggesting it's not a problematic food? So mm -hmm. I think uh, she's asking a bit about the changes over time. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I would say we probably don't know because the way that the reintroductions work is that as soon as a patient experiences notable symptoms, so reintroductions happen over a three day period. So day one, the individual will eat a small amount of um, that re-challenge food let's for example bread they might eat one slice whilst maintaining a low FODMAP diet if they don't get symptoms they'll proceed to day two and if they don't get symptoms they'll proceed to day three and each day you're increasing the quantity of that food that they're eating if on any day they get notable symptoms you would stop so we wouldn't actually ever have a um, situation the way that the diet is taught where you would proceed to eat that food even though it's causing you symptoms to see if it if it tailed off for example what I would say is that somebody can become um, used to their new normal so when they start a FODMAP diet if it's very effective for them suddenly they're not experiencing the pain and the bloating that they were before so you know that's and for some people it completely resolves and that feels really really good for them so obviously when they do reintroduce the food there may be a little bit of symptoms that suddenly they're much more sensitive to because their baseline has come down if that makes sense or they've mm -hmm. they got used to this new normal and so what I normally talk about with patients just kind of expectations so we're not saying to stop a challenge if they get any you know if they get some mild bloating that's actually very very manageable then actually we might still proceed to day two and they might think actually the day one portion size is, is totally fine um even people without ibs do experience some level of bloating and have some gas is completely normal so mm -hmm. we need to sort of discuss expectations we're not looking to have no symptoms what whatsoever but we are looking to maintain um symptoms that are manageable and i guess comfortable um the Monash also sort of uh, state that it's important to kind of retrial, you know, um, foods that you're sensitive to over time. So if you didn't tolerate bread, for example, to maybe try introducing it again kind of three to six months later. And I guess that sort of really reflects the fact that IBS can be relapsing and remitting. And actually, if you're in quite a good place with your IBS, your symptoms are well controlled, perhaps other stresses in your life have gone down. Maybe you may not be quite so sensitive um, at that time. And it's a good time to retry that food. We, uh, we've got several questions, but I'm just going to squeeze in one more. And this is from Alison. And she says um, she's she would like to know if exercise can be a trigger for IBS symptoms. Mm. Yeah, so exercise is an interesting one because in terms of symptoms, it's on a spectrum. So um, what we would call kind of gentle up to moderate exercise can certainly seem to have positive effects on the gut. So that would be things like walking, um, cycling, yoga, anything kind of which I guess uh, increases your heart rate and makes you warm, but doesn't, it's not really high impact exercise. Mm -hmm. And we know that that type of exercise seems to have a positive effect on gut motility for people who experience constipation predominant IBS, can actually help gas move through the gut. So um, there's been some studies done in people with IBS where they've had them, they basically um, induced gas, gas into the gut and then they've had them lie still or basically cycle cycle on an exercise but I can actually by having some gentle movement it actually helps gas to move through the gut um also exercise can have a really positive effect on on stress and our ability to manage stress so in that way it can be really positive however at the extreme end so high intensity exercise um so we're work where we're working at kind of our vo2 max so all out kind of like sprinting or when people are doing kind of hit classes that can actually um then start to aggravate symptoms so interestingly, we know that uh, people that do kind of ultra marathons and very sort of it's particularly runners as well, um, often experience quite severe symptoms. So I think around like 70 to 90 percent of sort of ultra endurance athletes um, that complain of like gut symptoms. 
from nausea, vomiting, pain. Um, and I think we've all probably heard of like runner's diarrhea is really or really common as well. And that's because really high intensity uh, exercise actually increases stress in the gut and particularly heat stress as well can have a um, this sort of uh, transient effect on the gut. So I would say gentle, moderate exercise is a really good thing to be talking to your patients about. But certainly if there's somebody that is going to lots of HIIT classes, if there's somebody who um, does a lot of high intensity exercise, there could be a correlation between that and their symptoms. And sometimes I'll actually talking to them about stepping that down or looking at potentially what foods they're eating around exercise can be um, can be really helpful. Lot to consider. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time on this session. Laura, would it be possible for you to jump onto Discord? Because there's a few other questions there for you. Yeah, no problem at all. I'll be happy to do so. And thanks everyone for your questions. <laughs>